Hi there, Michael Cross here, um, author of the Freedom from Conscience series, educator, as well as um, host of uh, UCY Radio's Unlock the Door radio show. I'm here at the moment to give you a brief explanation as to the basic ideas of Carl Jung, the noted psychiatrist who he and Sigmund Freud and Alfred Adler are mostly responsible for what we consider psychoanal psychoanalysis today. Um, but there's some stuff that he's been very influential with, stuff that has influenced people's lives today, even beyond psychology, and I'd like to discuss those things. But first, um, I'd like to introduce you here to a chunk of wood. And you're probably going, what the heck does a chunk of wood have to do with psychology? Well, because I want to show if we consider this to represent the human mind, um, exactly what Carl Jung believed uh, in reference to what made us who we are and how he differed from people such as Adler and uh, Freud. Now, you know, the things they had in common was they believed that if this illustrates the human mind, you know, a tr let's say a tree, a, a, um, and of course this is a sagittal, I mean, not sagittal, but a, a cross-section of that tree. Now, let's consider this part here. The part that we can readily see on the outside, the bark here, or this part here that if we scratch it, we could see it very well. That would be considered the conscious mind, let's say. Things that we can easily access. Then, of course, we go a little further, and then we can call this the pre-conscious mind. And the pre-conscious mind would be to illustrate such things as if I had to start trying to remember things for a test or something. Things I don't normally remember, or maybe there's something that um, is a memory that if I suddenly throw it out at you, like what were you doing on your 10th birthday? Uh, and you think and think and think and then go, oh yeah, I remember that birthday. Well, that would be kind of the pre-conscious. And again, just like with Freud, this is an area that... Um, it borders the subconscious and the actual conscious mind. But now Freud would, went down to the point where he was saying, here is our subconscious, where all the instincts and drives and memories and, and so forth are pushed into. And that, you know, in society, we have to kind of control those things. Well, now here's one of the differences between Jung and Freud. Jung believed that as opposed to Freud, that many of these things that are hidden in your um, subconscious, or what he would consider your personal subconscious, were, yes, they were drives, and they were energies, and so forth, but they were also not that bad, uh, as long as they were used uh, positively. And the thing is, that whereas, whereas this idea Freud had, the id as being kind of this evil force of libidinal energy, Ad, um, uh, Jung believed that uh, that could be represented by an archetype uh, or a symbol that communicates to us, and that could be represented as uh, the shadow. I'll get back to that in a few minutes here. But the shadow was, it was those same drives, but they weren't necessarily bad, any more than we could call a lion that goes out and kills a gazelle and eats it bad for killing the gazelle, it does what it has to do to survive. And so therefore the shadow might may, might not be totally a good idea to represent the shadow or id libidinal energies as being necessarily evil. But he goes a step further. Remember I said I'll go back to this here. He calls this area here, he, he creates something even deeper than Freud did and that's called the collective unconsciousness. And in Jung's idea, the collective unconsciousness is a genetic repository or spiritual repository of our ancestral uh, memory. So therefore, things that, uh, symbols and so forth that just seem to pop up, whether you're in a Navajo Indian reservation, or you're in China or Tibet, or in uh, Viking Europe, those symbols See, there's a lot of those symbols that are exactly the same. 
and they just keep popping up. And there's many things, if you talk to someone in another culture about spiritual experiences, they would understand exactly what you're saying, even though these cultures may have been separated by 5,000 years and an ocean. So the thing is, he believes that this is um, an energy that binds us. It's an energy that uh, links us all as human beings. Of course, if you know, you'd be closer if it's your family or or people closely genetically related to you. But these things uh, are an area that maybe connects to a more metaphysical world, which again is totally different than what Freud would believe. Uh, Freud tried to discount religion and these kinds of things, whereas Jung was not only a Christian, but he was very much into metaphysical, uh, occult, or hidden secret type things, um, and felt that psychology could go along and be connected to these kinds of things to help people. In fact, he would even go as far as to say astrology was something that could help in determining a person's personality and their uh, temperament. And now, Jung is also well known for dream analysis. Now, remember what I said about the collective unconsciousness? Well, if everyone was just the same, had the same kind of, uh, I mean, if they were all uh, the same in regards to this collective unconsciousness, it would go to reason that symbols and things we would dream of, regardless of who we were or where we were, would have an interconnection, and they actually do. And so, therefore, Jung very much popularized not only kind of New Age thought of the 60s, although it dates back further than him, he kind of popularized it, but also this idea that you could look at your dreams and they weren't just telling you something to you based on the symbols of your childhood or something like that, but it is something that is something that communicates to all people. And it might take different forms, like if you if you're you secretly want to disembark leave your culture and go somewhere and explore. Uh, an aborigine might dream of a canoe or something, um, but that same archetype could be an airplane for a person in a modern society. So therefore, um, the psychologist could sit down and be wondering, why is this person uh, feeling anxious and depressed and so forth, and yet they keep having these dreams that are that are, in a Jungian sense, telling them that they need to change their life, find themselves, and do something different. That's what he means by archetypes. And like I said, there's this shadow that I guess you could symbolize by maybe uh, uh, Darth Vader. Or um, you could symbolize uh, the... You know, you look through Lord of the Rings, lots of these kinds of stories, and find archetypes that just run straight through. Whereas people say, well, that's just the same story. Well, it's because it's the same story because it's saying the same things. And it connects us all, according to Jung, spiritually and as a human as a human race and uh, he's also famous for personality inventories because he believed that human beings uh, we need to know the personality of the person and therefore he kind of came up with a humanistic form of psychology in which you have to find out what the person's like and then you can determine how to deal with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis this has been he's, these personality inventories that he came up with are used in business. They're used in all kinds of areas where you have to find people that will mesh together and cooperate and be able to do projects together. So um, there's another area where most people don't recognize that personality and stuff like this. The study of of these and the typologies ranking them like an, an INTP, for instance, is what Jung was. Um, creative, uh, esoteric, and so forth, and would be very good in a, in, a, in a business situation. So if you want someone who's very creative and will come up with novel solutions, you would give someone a test and you would find that uh, you'd, a couple of percent of the human population is INTP, but you might try to find out who those INTPs are that have uh, applied to your job and then you can select among them to put into the role of creative, you know, kind of a creative person who will find new ways of doing things. Whereas some of the other type of personalities uh, 
might be better as chair people or the ones that actually implement things or people that work well in putting people together for projects. Uh, so in other words, Jung would say we shouldn't feel bad that we might be different and, and maybe not do something in a group situation that is as good as other people because we all have different personality traits and those come with built-in strengths. And so if we find out who we are, then we feel more at ease with ourselves and are able to... And if we know who we are, then we can better um, be healthy because we stop relying on the mask that we have created, the false uh, mask that we put on with other people as a defense mechanism in order to uh, blend in. And which can cause problems and in fact create depression and anxiety and so forth uh, if we don't really know who we are. So essentially, you know, if you want to use a 60s phrase, you know, Jung would say that people should get in touch with themselves and try to develop themselves. And when they are having problems, then it's the psychologist's role to be able to find out who they really are and then guide them in the process of better health uh, mentally as well as physically.